Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Alaska Eating Disorders Fall 2023 Echo. My name is Jenny Loudon. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance. Um, tonight's Echo session offers a forum for Alaskan interdisciplinary healthcare professionals to connect with eating disorders experts and with each other. This is the third of our four sessions this fall, and our final session will take place in two weeks on Thursday, November 9th. Each of our sessions includes a didactic presentation on a key eating disorder topic from a subject matter expert. Uh, there will also be time for questions and answers and a case presentation from a provider with the opportunity for you to engage and learn from other professionals in the field. Uh, the series has been guided by a hub team of professionals and experts in eating disorders. Um, they are in, um, have introduced themselves in the chat box and they have hub in their name, in their Zoom, uh, in their Zoom name. So you can feel free to ask them questions at any time. Um, our series has been approved for continuing education units. Participants can claim 1.5 credit hours per session of this ECHO series. And in order to claim those credits, you must attend this live session um, for at least 90% of the full session time, and then also complete an evaluation form, uh, which will, you'll be redirected to receive and then download. Uh, for confirmation of your continuing education credits. At the end of our session today, a link to that evaluation will be provided in the chat box. And I encourage all of the participants to fill out that survey as it does tell us how we're doing and how we can improve. So before we jump in, I just wanna provide a few Zoom reminders. Um, closed captions are automatically generated and are available by pressing the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, please take a moment to turn on your camera um, if you can, so that we can all get to know each other. Uh, the camera icon is on the lower left uh, of your screen. Please do keep your mic muted during the presentations and when you're not speaking, but you can mute and unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon on the lower left of the screen. Engagement with the group is integral to the All Teach, All Learn philosophy that underpins this echo session. So we really do encourage everyone to ask questions and to make comments during the session. Um, you can do so by utilizing the chat box or when appropriate, you can unmute yourself and share directly with the group. You're also welcome to private chat um, the session host or myself or any member of our hub team if you'd like um, a question shared, um, but that you want to be able to do so anonymously. It is helpful to get to know each other. So please introduce yourself in the chat box and by sharing your name, your role, your organization, where you're joining us from. And also it's nice to know what you hope to get out of this echo. If you are a hub team member, please introduce yourself as a hub team member as well. So please note that the opinions of this hub team and the presenters are their own. They do not necessarily represent uh, those of Akita or of any of our echo sponsors. Um, additionally, Project Echo is not HIPAA compliant. Therefore, no protected health information will be shared or displayed at any time. Uh, we really thank everyone for uh, following these guidelines. Finally, I want to take a brief moment to pause for a land acknowledgement. Um, though this is a virtual space, our ECHO team is joining you from Anchorage. And as such, we wanna thank the Denina people for their stewardship of the lands, the water, the air, and all life that sustains us within their traditional lands of the Takatnu and Cook Inlet region. We respect the Denine cultural ways and their homelands, and we shall strive to be good neighbors. So now I want to turn our session over to Akita's Executive Director, Be uh, Director Becca Kirian, uh, to share a bit about the vision that's driving this initiative, the purpose of the ECHO, and what's on today's agenda. Um, she can also provide some reminders about, about best practices and language for engaging in today's discussion. Thanks, Jenny. I'm Becca Kirian, the Executive Director of the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all this evening. The goal of this Project ECHO is to work together to grow capacity within our local healthcare system to better understand, diagnose, and treat eating disorders in Alaska. During our time together, we'll be learning through the presentations and discussions, and we want to be mindful of creating a welcoming learning community. Words matter, and they are powerful. This is an open space where all voices and bodies are welcome. We encourage you to seek ways to use inclusive, non-stigmatizing language. Let me start with a broad outline of this evening's agenda. We will begin with a presentation by Grace Schumacher titled, Why Wait? 
Grace is a graduate of the University of Alaska's dietetics program. She has been practicing behavioral health dietetics for the past eight years with a focus on eating disorders, nutrition, counseling. She earned credentials as an eating disorder specialist from the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals Foundation and is a founding board member of the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance. Grace is an outspoken advocate for improvement of eating disorder treatment access and a frequent guest speaker for topics related to client engagement and sociocultural factors in feeding and eating disorder issues. She is currently completing a doctorate in occupational therapy through Creighton University Alaska Pathway and, pan and plans to continue on with a fellowship in mental health occupational therapy. After the presentation, Grace will lead Q&A with our participants. Our session will conclude with a case presentation by Katie Tyden bell Without further ado, I'll pass the session over to Grace Schumacher to share our didactic presentation. Excellent. Hi, everybody. I'm so, so glad to be here tonight. I want to give a huge shout out to the Alaska Medical Library. They are so wonderful. <laughs> they were really helpful with uh, getting research that our libraries didn't have up here. So as we begin our presentation tonight, I do want to acknowledge firstly the importance of this topic and the division that's sometimes created between the client or patient. I'll use those terms interchangeably, the caregivers or carers and the professional team. Sometimes when a weight or a weight goal is assigned and it becomes a focal point of clinical care, it can be a numerical indicator of professional success. And I say that with kind of air quotes, because logically we know that there are other meaningful determinations of our work or our clients' treatment progress, but they might not be so objective. And of course, we have our own transference to be cognizant of when interacting with our clients or their family carers on the topic of weight and the immediacy of intervention needs. And so the client or their care carer also brings with them their history, um, which might include their thoughts about weight, of course. And so this might increase resistance when our client is provided with a weight goal, whether it's explicitly stated or not. And this conversation might feel like a minefield at times. Um, when the patient says, how could I possibly gain weight? I already hate myself at this weight. Um, so how are we to respond in a way that neutralizes that information and empowers change for our client? So hopefully um, tonight, our time together will be a platform to address concerns about weight restoration from many different angles and create cohesion through professional competencies and appreciation for what each treatment team member brings to this work. I'm an outpatient clinician, and so this presentation is geared toward providing outpatient support. Um, for the sake of time, this is an introduction to the topic. Uh, it, takes into the assumption that this is an otherwise healthful population where if the client had other health concerns, uh, physical health concerns, the discussion would be more complicated. Treatment of eating disorders is a team sport. So this discussion, there may be material that's more, more geared towards one professional or another at different times during the presentation in terms of scope of practice. It's my belief that knowing how each professional approaches the subject and what things help to guide our clinical reasoning can help us to be more aware of the complexities and the nuances in patient care. So whatever your profession you're representing, if there are things that you hear today and it resonates with you, whether it's a new idea or if you have experience to share on that, please add in the comments. It's nice to see that the, it's a lively chat room. Um, so that I can stay on time, I won't be looking at the chats at this point in time, but just know our wonderful hub team will be. You can add your questions that we'll come back to at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and feel free to add you know, any comments that you do have. So getting started. Trying to adjust these slides, oops, too far. Okay, so problematic weight. Um, you'll notice these three symbols on the side that indicate some different categories of problematic weight. And when I say problematic weight, that really is because it could, it provides um, some medical symptoms of starvation. First in this category, there's going from a higher weight to uh, you know, a weight that's maybe not quite as high as it was, but maybe within the normal weight category, it might still be in a higher weight category. These patients might not necessarily look starved. Uh, they might actually endorse that it's intentional weight loss. And so um, medical severity might not be assessed. 
medical severity, uh, uh, the weight loss actually might even be praised. And so that not surprisingly often leads to missed or de delayed diagnoses and that prolongs complications and it increases the eventual treatment time duration. It's estimated that about 30% of our hospitalized population in specialized care is in this one weight group. Um, I do have to acknowledge that that's old statistics. I don't have new statistics since the pandemic, but between the years of 2008 and 2014, the hospitalized population in that group increased five times over. So that's a huge um, area of growing concern. And especially, uh, I think that we're gonna see that continue. So this next uh, line, in some cases, there actually might not be any weight change at all um, before medical symptoms appear. Sorry, I do my notes at the same time. <laughs> Some patients might actually be at a, what's considered a healthy weight on the BMI category and then drop into a lower category, or some might be in a lower category their entire lifetime, um, and it just remains low through that. Um, there really aren't any differences between any of these groups in terms of age of onset, but a traditional anorexia presentation it, that is admitted to eating disorder treatment much sooner than any that's at a higher weight or even in a normal weight category, according to the BMI chart. This definitely shows gatekeeping that restricts access to early intervention. Both um, anorexia nervosa types, whether that's an underweight category or uh, not an underweight category, they're comparable in terms of high levels of emotional distress and psychiatric comorbidities, and yet a higher weight population is diagnosed much later on average. The possible symptoms here on the other column really do depend on developmental age. For example, um, our younger patients might not initially present with symptoms that are considered classic in eating disorders care. For those who are prepubertal or parapubertal and experience prolonged undernourishment, the presentation is actually commonly a drop in weight percentile followed then by a deviation from their linear uh, growth curve. However, there, there really should be some concern for a lack of appropriate weight gain, even if you're not seeing frank weight loss. And that's definitely one reason that height and weight measurements are tracked in primary pediatrics. And although there might be an absence of these other symptoms aside from slow linear weight initially, it's not really just a symptom of short stature. In fact, this actually does uh, affect the development and the metabolism actions of all of the other organ systems and produces some pretty drastic adverse consequences that last long, long term. Many of those effects of malnutrition for our younger population are reversible. Some are not fully reparable, including um, genetic height potential might not be reversible without some really early and aggressive weight restoration. These other traditional signs of medical injury are a common cause of hospitalization for adolescents and adults with restrictive eating due to the risk of mortality that they bring. Any restrictive eating disorder has the possibility of leading to these complications. It is clear that regardless of presenting weight, there are medical consequences of restrictive eating. And it's important to know that any subtype of anorexia nervosa, any weight category, um, sometimes the patient might not be concerned with the medical problems. It might actually feel normal to them. They've kind of adjusted to it over time, but they might be more concerned with fatigue or thinning hair or fertility problems or sport performance concerns, maybe things that infer a lower weight, but they're not necessarily objective measures of medical frailty. There might be joint laxity. There's increased injuries or metabolic abnormalities or decreased sex drive. And all of those might be part of the conversation when it comes to addressing a motivation to change. So what does that actually have to do with weight? Um, and how is that still part of the diagnostic criteria for severity of this illness? After all, we do know that uh, body weight's not a very effective descriptor for defining mental illness. And, that, and we also to know that a higher presenting body weight doesn't automatically confer medical stability. In fact, when a body weight is at the healthy or the overweight category, according to the BMI chart, such is the case with atypical anorexia nervosa, and in some cases with ARFID, 
we know that patients might still be just as medically fragile or on par with those at a very, very low BMI. And so regardless of the patient's actual weight status, the ability to heal from dysfunctional mental, behavioral, and nutrition components of the eating disorder are important. So when the weight's been restored to where the client might be labeled partial remission, there is still a really significant psychological struggle. The weight descriptor was initially added to the DSM to be very specific about anorexia from uh, anorexia nervosa from a diagnostic perspective. And yet the work isn't done with weight restoration. It might just be, get, be beginning. The fear of weight gain, of being fat or difficulty accepting one's own weight and shape might continue on for quite some time. Even though the DSM-5 has moved away from an absolute weight criteria for a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, um, there are modifier, modifiers for the severity of the condition that are still based in BMI and BMI percentile. With weight restoration, one patient said, I'm still anorexic, but the problem is I don't look anorexic. It's uncommon to have less, it's not uncommon to have less support or less access to professional services after having been weight restored. And so there actually might be some patient incentive to maintain that lower weight or to match their internal experiences of struggle to be able to connect to their resources. So in the question of what does weight really have to do with it, I have to say touche. And however, it is also really important to recognize that the DSM committee has stressed the importance of a more global psychological assessment for the diagnosis of anorexia nervosa aside from weight specifically, that can actually be really helpful in advocating for insurance reimbursement for your patient if their weight is not overtly low. Okay, so um, the American Psychiatric Association has some rough guidelines here for an adult. The, the diagnosis of anorexia nervosa is a BMI of 18.5 or lower. Um, and so that's the very bottom one on the chart, the full relapse. For a pediatric population, it's generally about the 10 percent, 10th percentile. But this chart, this research is from the Laureate Brain Institute out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and if this is the pro proposed uh, operational definitions that go through an entire treatment trajectory. Here, um, purging is induced vomiting, misuse of laxatives, diuretics, or enemas, and there aren't any other compensatory measures on this chart. But given the fact that defining severity or the presence of illness in this way relies more on weight, it is helpful for an adult anorexia population with a clinical classical um, anorexia nervosa presentation. In this sense, it's really just applicable to a fraction of the population that has eating disorders, but I do think it has theoretical relevance for other presentations as well if we were thinking about treatment along a similar trajectory. This box off to the side, um, is a representation of three theoretical patients and their pathway through the illness. It tops out here at 24 months. And so it really might not be a surprise that 50% of our population that is diagnosed with anorexia nervosa still meets full criteria for their eating disorder two decades later. That's pretty sobering. Hopefully this material tonight can help us to move that a little bit. There is consistent research justifications for looking at psychological markers as indicators of recovery. Um, on this chart, they use the eating disorders examination, the EDE, and standard deviations from that, but it also might include measures of body acceptance or eating-related behaviors or emotions that might be important to that individual or to their family. So even though the weight basis does have support from brain science, there's actually more to it. Uh, the brain chain, the, the brain, the human brain uses carbohydrate substrate for energy. And so the lack of overall energy also contributes to an overall reduction in brain matter, both gray matter and white matter. There are also regional changes in terms of volume decreases and, and brain activity decreases that are associated with weight changes. So uh, less volume and less brain activity that's regional if 
the BMI is decreased. The insular cortex volume was found to correlate positively with EDE symptoms that are measured on the EDE. So, so that's actually really helpful to know as well. Um, the concerns about eating and weight and shape are included on the EDE and the subscales that are likely really heavily influenced by processes that go through the insula. The insula has a lot of, of projections, both cortical projections and subcortical structures that are involved with regulation of appetite and eating and body state monitoring and taste perception and monitoring of the digestive system. The white matter of the brain represents myelination of neurons that are pathways of information on the brain. And this is especially true in the corpus callosum that connects the left and right brain hemispheres. The loss of myelin is attributed to lipid deficiency of malnutrition. And so recall that lipids are fats. If our patients are cutting calories and avoiding these high, higher calorie foods, that tends to include cutting out fats. And so there's a clear connection of, of the impact of inadequate fat intake on the brain, but really overall carbohydrate intake, um, overall energy intake matters as well. Just like any other cell, if they don't have the material to repair, the cellular structure weakens, and that's the loss of the white matter of the brain. It shows a weakening of the entire structure. It actually shows some cellular death as well. So it really isn't a surprise that malnutrition is also iatrogenic to eating disorder psychopathology. This isn't a new surprise when we think about the structure function link. The brain regions involved help to explain why patients with anorexia nervosa have characteristics of feeling disconnected from their bodies and having difficulty labeling and regulating their emotions and responding to biological needs like hunger and fatigue and differentiating experiences that otherwise might seem rewarding. Malnutrition changes the hippocampal structure in the brain that's bilateral. Hippocampal volume is related to BMI and anxiety and drive for thinness. Of course, that's one of the factors that that alters um, hippocampal morphology, it might be related to the onset, especially in periods of development, like adolescence and early adulthood. And there's part of the hippocampus that's used in future predicting as well. So this helps us understand why we might hear unrealistic predictions, like if I eat that cracker, I'm gonna gain a lot of weight. There's reduced cerebellar volume as well. That's linked to fine motor skill and balance, but it's also related to feeding and eating disorders. And the left superior temple gyrus has a smaller volume um, in restrictive eating that correlates with cognitions that are specific about restraint and obsessive thoughts, especially around eating and weight and body dissatisfaction and a drive for thinness. There's also a slower working memory reaction time. The brain changes have been found present within three weeks of diagnosis. And I don't really know from the research how long it took the patients to get their diagnosis, but we do know that that's pretty early. And in terms of when we say early intervention, that's within the first three years of diagnosis, but these brain changes have happened even at the time that the diagnosis is present. So this certainly makes a case for early detection lots of screening um, and early intervention. When it comes to the question of how long does it take for the brain to repair from malnutrition, just recall that these global and regional changes are related to weight and BMI. So the brain measurements that show weight restoration um, is necessary for brain recovery. You have to have restoration of the weight first, and then about six months after that weight restoration has been maintained, about 50% of that gray matter has recovered. In that six month time, almost all of the white matter has recovered, but complete recovery of the gray matter of the brain takes between 12 and 18 months, depending on how long that malnutrition has been going on for. Although the, there are some areas of the brain that appear that they don't completely recover. So BMI is inversely associated with eating disorder psychopathology, um, including obsessive compulsive symptoms, depression, and anxiety. What I think is really interesting about the brain changes associated with restrictive eating, long-term long restrictive eating, is that there's actually less depressive symptoms 
and less emotional experience. So for especially for our patients that have a difficulty, get difficult time regulating their emotions, it might feel better to them to be underweight and not eating a whole lot. But these other um, effects of brain changes are certainly part of um, the reasons why we're seeing the behaviors that we're seeing. This here, um, sensitivity to punishment or increased harm avoidance, our patients are so sensitive and um, any critical comment or anything that's perceived as being off-putting, including canceling an appointment, it might just feel really debilitating to our patients too. That comes directly from um, what's happening in their brain. But there are also sleep disturbances and mood-related drives for, uh, for exercise too. It's really important, the weight restoration and the normalization of eating and weight control behaviors are minimally necessary for eating disorder recovery. I don't really like the wording of this quote per se. I might say that it's foundationally necessary for eating disorder recovery, but the point is still the same. The need for weight restoration is really, really key. The lack of appropriate weight gain will stymie eating disorder recovery. This might be a cardinal metric that should be measured along with eating disorder conditions and behaviors and exercise or menstrual status, but acknowledge that it might be difficult to do so. In terms of normalizing eating and weight control behaviors, there really seem to be four main categories of reasons for the dysfunctional eating behaviors. And so in light of what we just covered in brain structure, these really should be no surprise too. Um, so four, four functions of dysfunctional eating. One is alleviating concerns of body weight, shape, and eating. Two is regulating emotions. Three, regulating one's self-concept and those negative thoughts. And the other, uh, the last one is regulating interpersonal relationships and communicating with other people. So our conclusions here, of course, are going to be that weight and shape concerns are a pretty major, major focus point here, but individualizing the conceptions of this dysfunctional eating behavior will be important for your client too. Um, these dysfunctional patterns of eating and food behaviors really create a positive feedback loop when engaged in dysfunctional eating behaviors. And this might look like food avoidance that gives relief from the stress of eating. <laughs> So it just kind of continues on that way. And in, in that way, we have to find a way to disrupt those dysfunctional eating cycles and provide some kind of normalization there. Before we talk to, uh, before we really get into um, figuring out what, how to determine our goal weight, I did want to just bring this up that weight history affects the course of treatment. Um, it's not entirely clear at this time why. For one thing, the experience of being at a higher weight might have attributed to the development of the eating disorder or the dysfunctional eating to begin with. They might've been bullying about body weight, shape, or size. And there might've been recommendations for weight loss by trusted adults or health healthcare workers. And so the psychosocial recovery might include more education, more repetition, more reinforcement, more encouragement, more attachment to recovery heroes that share similar physical attributes. Um, it also appears that physiological health indicators, those kind of brain-based indicators or behavioral indicators for recovery might actually be different for people that have been at previous higher weights also. Um, so it's just yet to be seen in, in research. So our traditional image of anorexia as being thin it certainly doesn't take into account a picture for some boys and men who have a more muscular ideal rather than idealizing thinness specifically. But one uh, research study participant said, I think there's a much greater opportunity for early intervention in the world of anorexia and other eating disorders. My experience was such that attention was paid to eating disorders was largely focused on only anorexia and only resulted in intervention at a point where the situation was particularly severe and obviously visible. And so when focusing on weight, clinicians really risk overlooking very sick people whose weight is not or is not yet dramatically low. That in early intervention matters. 
Some brief definitions here. Weight suppression is for adults, the difference between the presenting weight and their highest weight, or for children, it's the presenting weight versus their expected weight. A target weight, rest target weight restoration range or a target goal weight, treatment goal weight, therapeutic weight, those all kind of mean the same. And there's so many terms in there that probably mean the same thing. This could be a long list. Nutritional rehabilitation is kind of a long-term process to support medical stability and repair of organs that takes a long time and a lot of calories. Um, refeeding nutrition is more of an emergency sort of thing to support weight regain and recovery from acute malnutrition. So when it comes to determining goal weight range, genetics and following a growth curve really do matter for predictions of expected weight that can be helpful in pediatric and adolescent weight restoration. There are some ethnic growth, growth charts that might be helpful. If you have the biologic parental heights, you might use the Tanner predictive equations. Those aren't entirely helpful when it comes to accuracy though. Um, but largely the use of developmental charts include weight for age, height for age, and BMI for age. Those are helpful to individualize grow, uh, goal weight predictions if you have them available to you. There is an expectation for weight gain in the five years between age 10 and age 15. So right when we see a lot of eating disorders emerging, um, we would expect that individual to gain between 25 and 30 pounds on average. And in the next decade, another 20 to 30 pounds, and that's a minimum average. So we're really expecting to see some growth changes at this point when you're predicting a weight, you might not have seen that weight for years um, or they haven't ever achieved that developmental weight. So that's something to plot on and be expecting to look at. In terms of um, looking back on prior weight, take a look at their BMI percentiles or height uh, before weight loss occurred to facilitate any catch-up growth if necessary and points at which menstrual abnormalities might have occurred, including primary or secondary amenorrhea, or for men, uh, low testosterone. And finally, noting the weight at which the individual is able to consume the recommended daily allowances for weight and age. Your final determination of a treatment goal weight is the calculation that is the highest of the following. You're either the minimum 50 50th percent BMI for age and gender. If you have a female patient, it's two kilograms above the weight where they experience a loss of their menstrual period. Or it's the weight at which that patient can consume at least the recommended dietary allowance for their weight and age and maintain weight there. There are really good reasons why loss of menses is no longer a diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa, but for the purposes of weight restoration, it is helpful to consider, even if it is variable. Um, amenorrhea might occur before any weight loss is seen in up to 20% of our patients. For some patients, they might not actually ever experience a loss of a menstrual cycle, even at a very, very low weight. And the return of menses is also variable, um, usually between 90 and 95 percent of the ideal body weight or close to right above uh, the prior menstruating weight. Body size does not significantly affect the loss of menses. So uh, for our patients who either came from a higher weight down or have maintained at a low body weight, we see um, a loss of menses in both both populations. For our patients that engage in vomiting behavior for weight control, they're up two to three times more likely to experience irregular menses rather than a loss of their menstrual cycle for this like three month period of time. And, um, and so in terms of a return of the menstrual cycle, it's, it's generally not seen until reaching about two kilograms above their prior menstruating weight. But for our patients who were in 
a higher weight body, they probably need to uh, reach a higher body weight than otherwise. I'm very happy to announce that there is actually a consensus on this. Um, from the American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics, the American Society for Parental, Parental and Enteral Nutrition, and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. They are all um, in sync proposing to use a combination of mean body mass um, percentile, Z-scores, and percent weight loss for pediatrics with additional classifications for malnutrition severity. And so that's this next slide. I'll just jump to it and then I'll jump back. Um, so, so this is for adults, and, I'm sorry, adolescents and young adults with eating disorders, probably up until about age 22, and then want to jump to the other classification. For our adults, um, we'll use the Z scores still, um, and that's a, a separate chart. And then you could use uh, the ham weight for ideal body weight, but it tends to be that the if you, if you have a population that's either underweight to begin with or overweight to begin with, those might not work quite as well, but with a percent of usual body weight or percent of highest body weight, there wasn't a difference in diagnostics for that. So that tends to be a good one for adult malnutrition, that percent UBW, and then also would want to document a rate of weight loss there for the adult malnutrition guidelines. Considering higher uh, prior high weight, so validation of a weight history um, doesn't need to get in the way or can't get in the, in the way of uh, weight gain for medical stability. Those with a pre-morbid high BMI often present with a faster rate of weight loss. And you can see that here on the chart that um, A point is this client's highest weight and it dropped pretty rapidly down to the low weight there on point B. Um, these patients tend to therefore have more medical complexities, even if they remain in that kind of normal weight range and they're not in a very, very low BMI category. It remains really unknown whether our patients who've had a higher body weight need to return to their previous BMI percentile to achieve long lasting recovery and emotional well being. There's some discrepancy with this. We can agree that some weight restoration is needed for physical and psychological recovery from malnutrition, but there's really disagreement on how much weight restoration to go for so far. Um, this case highlights a concept of uncertainty of how much weight to regain and at what rate. So you can see also in the same way that this patient lost weight really rapidly, they refed really rapidly as well. Um, so, when the patient was admitted here, um, they hadn't had any prior history of PCOS, but when they refed back to um, point C is when she regained her menses, which was actually a little sooner um, than I would have expected because typically for patients that are in higher weight bodies, they need to be over that 50th percentile. D is where this patient um, was diagnosed with PCOS. So there's a question um, about should we feed slower and, and hope that we get some medical stability if we go at a, a slower rate. But in, in other research, there was an outpatient um, FBT study done in 2017 that was with patients that are at previous high weights. Their eating disorder symptoms improved even without weight gain or complete weight restoration. So we might need to consider um, you know, maybe not refeeding at, uh, at the same rate that we would otherwise. So and, the, and, this, Grace, I'm gonna, and Grace, I'm just going to give you, you've got about a five minutes left. Yes, I've got my timer going. Thank you. Uh, this is a really abbreviated version of the, the therapeutic modalities that you might be familiar with for each of these eating disorders. Um, 
FBT came out ahead for anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa in terms of weight regain initially, but the remission rates were not great. Um, it's interesting though, it doesn't matter what modality you choose. There, there's a very, very strong predictive relationship between the therapeutic alliance and the psychotherapy outcomes and in individual therapy. And that's across alliance, across outcome measures, across treatment approaches, across patient characteristics, um, that therapeutic alliance really ma matters. So how do we get the therapeutic alliance? And this is kind of a chicken and egg question. Does the therapeutic alliance come first or uh, do the symptom improvements come first? And as it turns out, it really seems like the symptom improvement comes first and then the patient trusts you. So, so this is a really important case then for um, professional competencies so that you can get those symptom improvement right away. At very least, it's a bi-directional relationship. Um, here's the problem though. Uh, in research studies that I was reading, mental health clinicians can only tell if their patients are, are worsening about 20% of the time. And then if their patients aren't really getting worse but aren't also getting better, it's detected even less than that. So you've got to have some ways to measure it. And we'll get to the measurements too. It goes for the, the same for um, dietitians in terms of being able to measure outcomes. So these are some nutritional approaches to weight restoration. There's the exchange system that's really used widely. Um, it's used in the diabetic population too. So there's a lot of material that's available. These on the black would be kind of pros for it. And in the blue, things that might not feel so great. So um, this was a study that was done in FBT, family-based treatment for adolescents and questioning the caregivers on what they liked or didn't like about each of these uh, nutritional approaches. Calorie counting, uh, some of the parents really appreciated that to define clarity. And some of them said, absolutely not. I've never calorie counted and I hate it. It did produce some less arguments at meal times, but it was really cumbersome when it came to transitioning. Um, and then the plate by plate method is something that's based on the my plate graphic idea. There's some material online too for that. It's really helpful and intuitive for some families. It's culturally sensitive, but it can also feel really vague. So the take home message from this one is that there are a lot of approaches. There's no gold standard, and it's kind of similar into what treatment modality you're gonna pick. It's a co-created goal. The, the ways that we're gonna decide, are our patients getting better, or do we need to change our treatment plan? It's gonna be by Evidence based, uh, practice based evidence. We need to be um, doing some kinds of these record keeping so that we can measure over time. And our speaker next week, she created her own. So there, there are some. So the next couple of slides here that are validated scales that you might be familiar with. And there are some like this one that was created um, by someone because they couldn't find any that they liked doesn't really matter if you have one that's already validated or if you and your client kind of create one together, if you have one that works for your patient population better, just as long as you have something to track over time and you can um, clue into whether or not your patient's meeting their goals. Some barriers to weight restoration, definitely gastrointestinal complaints are kind of to be expected, especially with a malnourished population. And so this might be more predominantly the anorexia and the avoidant restrictive feeding and eating disorders um, populations. But look at these really high percentages of digestive complaints, nausea, constipation, loss of appetite, abdominal fullness, um, really severe, really uncomfortable. And so you might rely on the medical provider or the, or the dietitian to help educate the patient on why they're having these symptoms. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't be eating. It means that their body's really, really sick and it has to be fed. It has to be refed in order for these symptoms to resolve. But there might be some medications that make it more comfortable along the way. Um, and it is definitely a reason to be consistent with eating through the day rather than having larger meals or snacks. The fear of weight gain, for sure. Don't we all hear this? 
Um, and, and so again, re-educating the patient, talking to them about, uh, or talking to their caregivers about their current developmental healthy weight range so that they're not like fixed on a number specifically. That really has to get reworked about every three or six month, months for a pediatric population and helping to address any weight goals that are unhealthy or unrealistic in the context of the eating disorder treatment. That's, uh, we'll keep going back to this, but there are some really, really good podcast resources too. Um, so connect with, with those. In terms of body changes, uh, these can be really tough. Again, it's, it might really affect the rate that you choose for your patient to refeed. We might choose to go at a, a half a pound a week or half a pound every other week to kind of normalize things with that. Um, but the body fat composition at the end also really matters. Because our patients are going to say, I just, I can't do any more. And we might need to re-educate them that actually in terms of health for a body, they're going to need a higher body fat composition um, probably than before they had their eating disorder. Uh, complicated family system. Ooh, I gotta skip it. I'm sorry. Um, yes. I'm just going to skip to the last slide because I know I'm out of time. Um, in terms of nutrition psychoeducation needs, probably in any profession that you are in, you're going to be touching on some kind of nutritional needs. This is a food pyramid that was designed in 2018 for the use in um, Australia. And it's about eating all of the food groups. Well, a lot of the patients said that they appreciated this one. It just felt less judgmental and more accepting than um, other more traditional ways of approaching food, but certainly not really using a nutrition facts label because what the, what the research says is that in about 20, 20, 20 25% of our population, depending on male or female, it increases restrictive eating, um, increases unhealthy dieting or weight loss methods and can increase binge eating as well. Um, and then the last thing that I'll leave you with is uh, there's been research that says that regardless of the therapeutic modality that you come out with, if you're focusing on skill building and normalization of eating, your patient's going to make changes in the symptomatology of their eating disorder as well. So um, I hope that was helpful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Grace. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for questions or comments. Remember, there's no such thing as a dumb question. You can raise your hand and unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question aloud, or feel free to use the chat function and type your question in there. Um, and feel free to go ahead and start asking some questions. Of members, feel free to ask questions as well. All right, and we have some questions coming in now. Um, one for you, Grace. Do you feel the same guidelines apply to adults? So, new guidelines in terms of this nutrition education. Just want to get some clarity about that. Um, I just ask about same guidelines. Um, Jessica, do you have any clarification you'd like to to add on that question? Yeah, the same guy. Sorry, not on this slide. The same guidelines for weight gain and determining goal weights. Yeah, absolutely, they do actually. So, um, in that one slide, I I can maybe find it again. Um. There was some of them that are used more for children and adolescents and some that are used more for adults, but in terms of like finding that curve again, um, getting back to the premenstrual weight or uh, even a little bit higher than that is advisable. Okay, and we have another question coming in. Um, how do you align with other team members around the estimated treatment goal weight? 
Um, this person's found that for growing children, that they tend to base the goal weight range on a higher amount. However, sometimes other team members go lower. Any tips for alignment? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the amount of data that you have, how many data points, so help you determine or have your clinical judgment reasoning um, document it the best that you can. And the more that you can communicate with the team about why you're setting the goal weight range where you are at that point in time, or the rate of refeeding at that rate, the more buy-in you're going to have from the other treatment team members who may not be using as many data points. All right. And we have another one for you. Um, this person has seen patients who have elevated BMIs and weight loss due to eating disorders. And some facilities make the goal of gain, make the goal of weight gain is the weight prior to the eating disorder. Sorry if that sounded a little confusing. Wasn't my best wording. Um, this is challenging for the patient who yeah. has been told they were overweight. Any suggestions? It, it is really challenging. I, I think um, as an outpatient provider, I have a lot more leeway with this. And, and I take an approach that brings a lot of um, patient autonomy into the perspective too. We certainly have to do some weight restoration when there's been a drastic underweight to the point of some medical instability problems. There has to be weight gain, but there's that question, right? How much needs to be recovered and um, can we refeed at a longer rate, at a slower rate to be, um, to get that medical stability and the psychological improvement. And I think the research is so inconclusive right now that it has to be kind of a team decision, including the patient. Okay. And another question, how to navigate weight restoration with adding back in activity like sports? That's a really good question. There are actually guidelines that are printed for that, um, that take into consideration medical stability factors, psychological mm -hmm. factors. Um, if you wanted to send me a message or send a message to the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance, That's I can get that information to you. That's Great. Um, and we have one about curiosity in determining a premenstrual weight if there was restriction or dieting prior to first menses. Yeah, absolutely. So in that one, I'd see if you can go back and look at the growth curves before and then kind of use those predictive equations or predictive measurements to plot where you think it should be along that same growth line for BMI. Right. Um, and certainly you want to look at m achieving a full genetic height potential as well. But for, um, for BMI, that's the one that you want to use for determining that particular weight percentile. Great. And we have kind of a comment, um, just thinking that we should assess the patient's enjoyment of, a f of food as well as hunger urges and responding to these urges without guilt or anxiety. I agree. It's going to take some time before that part of the brain allows food to taste good or be rewarding. Um, and it's a little bit subjective too, but yeah, yeah, that's a, a good one in terms of deciding whether or not recovery achievement goals are happening. And we have another question about how can families support adequate refeeding and renourishment when there is limited or no access to a registered dietitian? Oh, so actually um, just parent empowerment is so important. Uh, parents really question if they know how to feed their kids, but they've been doing it for a long time and, and they know how to set boundaries for other safety behaviors. Eating is really the same. So as much as you can empower the families to be eating together, for the parents to be providing the food, um, to be giving those reinforcement messages that eating is important, uh, that's how to do it at home. And it doesn't take a registered dietitian to do that. Okay. And I'm going to give a few more moments just for some last minute questions. If anyone wants to type some into the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand. We still have a few minutes to cover questions before we move on to our next section.
All right. If I don't see any more questions, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next section. Um, that was, they were great questions, really good dialogue. Uh, I'm going to pass this over now to Dr. Melissa O'Neill to introduce our case presentation.